Ryomen Sukuna is the most broken character in Jujutsu Kaisen. No, in anime, even Saitama would struggle. He's a god tier level sorcerer that is so powerful he's basically unstoppable. To show you why no one can defeat him, I'll be breaking down every single one of his abilities that he has at his fingertips, literally. And I'm going to explain each of his attacks for you, including one of the most powerful curse techniques in Jujutsu Kaisen, period. Now, let's start with Sukuna's most famous ability, the Cleave and Dismantle. Dismantle is basically a long range slash that changes up depending on whether the thing you're slicing is tough or thick. And Sukuna doesn't need to touch anything to activate Dismantle. Also, even if you're all wrapped up with curse energy, you're not untouchable against Sukuna because a single Dismantle can easily slice you up. Unless you're Gojo with the Limitless ability, which as you know can stop motion. But still, Sukuna found a way to bypass the Limitless. Now the real question is how did Sukuna bypass the Limitless? Well, I want you to know that you'll know by the end of the video. And actually, there are two answers for this. Next up, we've got the Cleave. Think of Cleave as the twin brother of Dismantle. But unlike his bro, Sukuna's gotta touch you to make Cleave work. Cleave's effectiveness adjusts based on the user's toughness and the level of the user's cursed energy. Cleave also has other variations like Spiderweb. When Sukuna touches the target, he creates a spiderweb pattern on the ground, breaking the target down in a single slick move. Now, if you think Sukuna can only cut things, never forget, he can also literally cook you and oven bake you with his fire. And all he has to do is say the magic word, Hoog, and there'll be a fire arrow right in your face. Sukuna is also a master of the reverse curse technique, or RCT for short, which is a skill sorcerers use to heal themselves. Plus, reverse curse technique is super complicated. Only a few sorcerers can use it. So how does it actually work? Well, if we do some Jujutsu Kaisen math here, as Gojo explained in chapter 74, curse energy is born from negativity. Even if you can reinforce your body, reconstructing body parts is impossible. That's why you have to multiply negative energy together to make positive energy. In short, reverse curse technique is negative energy times negative energy, which is equal to positive energy. This positive energy is the magic behind regenerating new flesh. It's exactly how Sukuna was able to whip up a new hand after Yuji lost one fighting a finger bearer. It's also the trick behind how he fixed Yuji's heart and patched up Megumi in Shibuya. He even pulled it off during his epic showdown with Gojo in Shinjuku. This battle probably showcased the most complex use of reverse curse technique, especially with them constantly using their domain expansions. Why? Well, to keep spamming your domain expansion, you've got to destroy the part of your brain that stores curse techniques and heal it with positive energy. And ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly why they call this series Lobotomy Kaizen. But aside from the reverse curse technique, Sukuna has a different way to heal his body. And that is by transforming into his original body. Yet the question is, how is Sukuna able to change into his old body? Is this a binding vow? Also, could he do that when he was human? or only after he became a cursed spirit. That's why in theory, Sukuna is similar to Mahito, which I've explained in this video. Next up, Domain Amplification. Domain Amplification is an anti-domain shield that wraps around Sukuna, all made from his own domain. This epic shield totally canceled out Goju's limitless technique. Crazy, right? This was also the key for Sukuna to actually be able to touch Gojo. Another amazing benefit of the amplification is that it totally cancelled out Gojo's domain, the unlimited void. Normally, getting caught in the unlimited void means you're stuck like a deer in headlights, because the unlimited void floods your brain with so much information you end up totally frozen. Now, if you remember, Gojo's domain didn't affect him or anything he was touching himself, right? So, Sukuna survived the unlimited void by touching Gojo. Effing genius. And this is just one of the ways Sukuna bypassed the Limitless. However, using domain amplification means you can't use your own curse techniques since you're all wrapped up by your own domain. But since Sukuna is, you know, the goat, he managed to use domain amplification while using his domain expansion. Which means Sukuna was so used to using domain amplification, he basically cheated the system. Now, Sukuna had another anti-domain shield called the Hollow Wicker Basket. 
This technique is the OG simple domain. Like its name suggests, the hollow wicker basket creates a spherical barrier around the caster that looks exactly like a woven basket. When it's activated, that guaranteed hit you'd expect from a domain expansion gets cancelled. Meaning, any attacks aimed at Sukuna will miss when he's under the shield. But it doesn't block his enemies from using their techniques. Usually, busting out the hollow wicker basket means you can't use your own curse techniques at the same time. But of course, with Sukuna and his extra pair of arms, he can use other curse techniques too. Luckily, he was tied up dealing with the Jacob's Ladder technique and fighting with Yuji, Yuta, and Maki all at once. Next is the unexpected move that nobody ever saw coming. The Black Flash. In Chapter 253, Sukuna unleashed Black Flash for the first time against Maki Zenin. Like it sounds, the Black Flash is all about cursed energy sparkling into black bursts of lightning, ramping up the user's attack to double its power. This magic moment happens when a sorcerer perfectly syncs cursed energy with a physical attack in a split second, causing a space warp and unleashing that iconic black lightning. Picture it as the ultimate critical hit. But there is something interesting that happens after using Black Flash a second time. After using two Black Flashes, Gojo got his reverse curse technique back in action. Fast forward to chapter 255, Sukuna also had a weakened reverse curse technique, giving Gojo students and Team Ghetto the advantage. All until the King of Curses also unleashed his second Black Flash. And you know what's going to happen now, right? All of them are screwed. And somebody's gonna die, okay? Comment below who you think will die next. I wanna know because I'm losing my mind thinking about it right now. Is it just me or what? Next, Sukuna's Domain Expansion, the Malevolent Shrine. This domain expansion probably has the widest range for one simple reason. It doesn't have a barrier. This means Sukuna's Domain can stretch way beyond a tiny space and reach a lot of people. What really amps up this domain expansion is a binding vow that's supposed to let people escape the Malevolent Shrine, but honestly, it just makes things even crazier. This extends Sukuna's reach all the way up to 200 meters. That's exactly how Sukuna wiped out thousands of people all at once in Shibuya, without a second thought, in order to tame the strongest Shikigami ever, Mahoraga. When Sukuna activates his domain expansion, his cleave and dismantle attacks actually change their targets, almost like a heat-seeking missile. Dismantle is used for slashing non-living things, like objects such as buildings or cars, and cleave targets anything infused with cursed energy, like sorcerers. Plus the sure hit effect of Malevolent Shrine creates endless slashes that shred everything till there's nothing left, just dust. But what if I told you there's a way to destroy the Malevolent Shrine? Domain expansions like Unlimited Void can be destroyed by breaking the outside barrier. However, since Malevolent Shrine is a barrierless domain, it can't be destroyed in the usual way either. So the only way to weaken this domain is by hurting Sukuna. Now let me tell you about how powerful these two cursed tools are that Sukuna uses. Did you know that Sukuna annihilated the strongest sorcerers who served two of the most powerful clans during the Heian era? Not with his techniques, but with only two cursed tools. The first tool, Kamutoke, is a weapon that looks exactly like a Vajra. This comes from Hinduism, symbolizing the properties of one, a diamond. Because you know, a diamond is indestructible. Diamonds are forever. And two, a thunderbolt, representing the formidable, unstoppable force that it is. This mirrors the exact power of Kamutoke as this curse tool can unleash bolts of electricity. Side note. Vajra is also the weapon of the god of storms and the heavens in Hinduism, Indra. Sukuna's second curse tool is Hitin, a trident that looks like a Trishula from Hinduism. However, Hitin's exact powers are still a mystery. But since it looks just like a Trishul, which in Hinduism symbolizes powers associated with Shiva, the god of destruction, one of the three supreme deities, there's a chance that Hitin could be very overpowered. By the way, the three points on the weapon, Trishula, carry many hidden meanings. The most common of these are creation, preservation, and destruction. Sukuna made a lot of binding vows to gain power. I mean, he has a binding vow in his domain expansion. And he also made some with Kenjaku, as well as Yuji Tadori. If you remember when Yuji died, Sukuna revived Yuji, but with two conditions. 
Number one, Yuji would let Sukuna control his body for a minute at the word in chain. And number two, Yuji would forget what the binding vow was. Yuji was forced into agreeing with this unfair deal after losing a mental battle to Sukuna. Sukuna finally used this binding vow in chapter 212 and successfully turned Megami into his vessel. So, since he currently possesses Megami's body, he can now use one of the most powerful techniques in Jujutsu Kaisen, which is the Ten Shadows technique. But how powerful is it really? It's so powerful that one of its Shikigami named Mahoraga can actually rival the Six Eyes and the Limitless because this technique lets him summon 10 shadow-like monsters known as Shikigami. Plus, if you remember, according to Gojo, the reason why the Gojo and Zenin clans hate each other is due to historical conflict. The previous leader of the Gojo clan who possessed the Six Eyes was killed by the former leader of the Zenin clan, a 10 shadow technique user, which means that the 10 shadow technique could surpass the Six Eyes. Now let's start with the first of the 10 shadows, the divine dogs. Think of them like the starter Pokemon, because these dogs are the first Shikigami you get if you inherited the 10 shadows technique. These divine dogs can easily tear curses apart and are super useful for tracking scents. With Sukuna's takeover, the divine dogs look like this. Instead of only two dogs, there's like four or six of them. But why do they look like that? Because Sukuna didn't give them a stable form. He instead expanded their range. This tweak also makes them harder to destroy. Now wait, what happens when one of the Shikigami is completely destroyed? For you to get this answer, you'll need to first understand what happens if a Shikigami doesn't have a stable form. So, without a proper form, the Shikigami can't act on their own, which in turn reduces their attack power. But with Sukuna, he can compensate for that with his own immense cursed energy and output. So the reason why Sukuna did this is that when a Shikigami is destroyed, it can't be summoned again. And why would Sukuna do that? Because the power left behind by the Shikigami that was killed or destroyed will be inherited by the other shadows. Okay, so remember the white dog? When it died, it kind of merged with its shadow twin and became Divine Dog Totality. A 10 shadows user can also mix two different shadows, like the whale's unknown abyss, and new a totality, which gives birth to merged beast Agito, who's also a very broken Shikigami. Now, how powerful is Divine Dog Totality? This werewolf-like Shikigami is super fast and so strong that it can damage special grade cursed spirits, like Hanami. Hanami was super tough. I mean, even Megami, Inumaki, and Kamo couldn't scratch this cursed spirit. Now, when Sukuna was throwing down Yorozu, instead of a skinny werewolf, Sukuna's Divine Dog Totality was totally jacked. If Yorozu hadn't dodged its attack, she would have been crushed right then. I mean, she died anyway. Next up is the Toad, aka Gama. By the way, Sukuna hasn't shown us how he uses this one yet, but this Toad is a lot tougher than you think. Gama is super handy for backup because it's so big. It can carry people who are hurt right in its mouth. Its tongue isn't just for show either. It can also be used for quick rescues, or it can snatch targets and even smash them around. We also saw Megami fuse Gama with another Shikigami called Nui to become a Toad with wings known as the Wells Unknown Abyss. These flying Toads can zip around, grab enemies, or stop attacks with their tongues. The problem is, these combined toads aren't as tough as their solo forms. The good news? You can summon them again and again as long as Gamma and Nui are still alive. So, Nui. This Shikigami looks like a huge owl, but instead of a regular owl head, it's got this spooky white mask that resembles a skull. However, its most interesting feature is its wings, making Nui great for sneaking around or catching a lift over long distances. Damn, I wish my parrot was this useful. But Nui's wings aren't just for flying, they transform into a full-on weapon system. Get hit by one of Nui's feathers and bruh, there will be pain. Those purple sparks will lock you up, paralyzing you on the spot. Nui can also use those speedy wings to block attacks, to give its user protection. But Sukuna took Nui's game to a whole nother level. When Sukuna summoned this bird, Nui wasn't just big, it was massive. This bird perched itself on what, a 74 floor building? I don't know the exact height, but damn, that bird is huge. I think Nui can now carry around two to four people. Plus, if Megumi's version of Nui can paralyze you, well, that bird is mid because Nui 2.0 can bring the storm. I mean, bro, it unleashed a lightning bolt so massive that if Angel hadn't stepped in, Nui could have taken down the massive buildings as if they were nothing. Next up, the Great Serpent, Orochi. Orochi was perfect for surprise attacks, capable of swiftly attacking and ensnaring targets. Sukuna destroyed Orochi back in Season 1, 
But during his battle against Gojo, Sukuna merged Orochi with other Shikigami like the Round Deer and Tiger Funeral. The Round Deer has a unique ability. It can heal through reverse curse technique. And its positive energy is so strong that it can neutralize another sorcerer's item or weapon charged with curse energy. This is how it countered Yorozu's liquid metal which is made of curse energy. Next up, Tiger Funeral. This Shikigami is the only one that hasn't been fully shown yet. Either way, Sukuna fused it with four other Shikigami, creating Nui Totality, Merged Beast, Agito. Since it's a combo of a deer, serpent, tiger, and Nui, this muscle mommy is a very strong. It's not just fast and strong, it can also heal and use lightning, making it one of the strongest Shikigami in the series. It might be broken, but Gojo did still manage to destroy its ass. Next up, Piercing Ox. This massive beast boasts a tough shell and strong horns. It can only move in a straight line, but the longer the charge, the more powerful it becomes. It's so strong that it went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Yorozu, even breaking off her insect armor. Next, Rabbit Escape. Literally from the name itself, this Shikigami helps you escape from sight by covering the battlefield with cute, fluffy rabbits. Think of it as a furry smokescreen. But Sukuna added a different twist to this. Sukuna used Rabbit Escape to corner Yorozu, then dropped Max Elephant on her, utterly crushing her. Besides crushing enemies with its weight, Max Elephant can also unleash a torrent of water from its trunk, capable of breaking through walls. Sukuna masterfully used Max Elephant's water blast to copy the effects of Chozo's piercing blood technique. And you know how strong piercing blood is. It can tear through walls or even a human body. Now, I'm not saying Max Elephant's water is as strong as that. But I think even with Max Elephant's type of pressure, it can easily take down the strongest sorcerers. This is also the type of pressure I sometimes have in the morning in the washroom. Comment below if you also have that. But these nine Shikigami are nothing in comparison to this last one. This Shikigami is so overpowered, it can even rival the six eyes. Plus, it has a very long translated name. Eight-handled sword divergent Sila Divine General Mahoraga. So Mahoraga is the strongest Shikigami. So strong that no Ten Shadows user had ever tamed him until Sukuna did. By the way, if you're 10 Shadows user, how do you actually get a Shikigami? Well, remember, you can only tame a Shikigami once you've defeated it. You must defeat or exercise a Shikigami in a ritual to use them. But you can summon them anytime you want to exercise them. So what makes Mahoraga so broken? First, Mahoraga had a powerful weapon, a shiny sword attached to its forearm called the Blade of Extermination. This blade contains positive energy, making it perfect for killing cursed spirits. And how can that sword easily kill curses? Because according to Yuta, cursed spirits can be exercised by channeling positive energy from the reverse curse technique into their bodies. With that kind of power, the sword of extermination can be considered at the same level as a special grade curse tool. Second is Mahoraga's true innate power and the scariest power of them all, adaptation. You see that eight-spoked wheel or Dharma Chakra, obviously this name is derived from Hinduism, floating on top of Mahoraga's head. When injured by any cursed spirit or attack, Mahoraga begins adapting to that attack when the wheel starts to move. Once the wheel completes its eight movements, Mahoraga's adaptation is complete. However, if you try to hit Mahoraga with the same attack multiple times in between the adaptation, his adaptation becomes faster. Mahoraga can easily destroy a domain expansion even if he's inside it. You and I both know how difficult it is to destroy a domain from the inside since it's stronger there. So there's only one way to defeat this godly Shikigami and that is by using a different technique while it's adapting to the first attack. That is why back in Shibuya when Sukuna saw Mahoraga adapt to all of his slashing techniques he decided to use the fire arrow technique to defeat the Shikigami. Sukuna was an evil genius when he used Mahoraga. Rather than letting the Shikigami do all the heavy lifting Sukuna shared in the effort too. In his fight against Yorozu Sukuna bore the adaptation burden himself by enduring Yorozu's hits until he summoned Mahoraga to break through her true sphere. In the battle with Gojo, Sukuna needed Mahoraga just to survive Gojo's domain expansion. Whenever Sukuna wasn't activating domain amplification to attack Gojo within the unlimited void, he had Megami's soul bear the burden of adapting to Gojo's domain. At the same time, allowing Sukuna to experience unlimited void five times before summoning Mahoraga to completely adapt to the unlimited void. With Gojo's domain expansion out of the picture, Sukuna focused on adapting to Gojo's infinity. So Sukuna bore the burden of adaptation, wearing the big wheel above his head. 
This was a bit tricky because he couldn't engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Gojo without using domain amplification. And domain amplification also interrupted Mahuraga's adaptation. So adapting to Gojo's infinity is so complicated that Mahuraga needed four attempts to fully adapt. When Mahuraga was summoned, he was able to use the blade of extermination to cut through Gojo's chest. Plus, all thanks to Mahuraga, Sukuna figured out something about Gojo's Limitless, and Sukuna unlocked his most overpowered move yet. Sukuna's great dismantle, the slash that cuts the world. By using Mahuraga's adaptation of Gojo's Limitless, Sukuna's world dismantle can bypass and cut through space itself. However, Sukuna was able to cut through Gojo's Limitless due to a specific binding vow he made. By the way, unleashing the Great Dismantle requires chanting Dragon Scales, Repulsion, and Paired Falling Stars along with performing the Enmatin hand sign for his domain expansion. And the reason Sukuna can easily wield these techniques is because he has control over something in the brain called the Black Box.